Good afternoon. As my name is Chiwendo Madubeze. So I'm going to present on infection diseases affecting Africa. So the goal of our lecture is to give a brief introduction to what Africa and its region is all about, and also to talk about what is infection diseases, type of organism causing infection diseases, and the, the burden of these infection diseases in Africa, how it affects Africa, how it affects the economy of Africa. We also talk about the impact of these diseases in Africa, demographic, economic, and educational indicators. We also look at the global impact of the economic and human development. Then we'll now look at the infection disease, major infection disease, because there are a lot of infection diseases, but we'll look at the major infection diseases and their mathematical studies so far. Then open questions for further research. Now in Africa, we have, Africa is the second largest continent in the world, and it contains about 54 countries. When you come to the world, it's the second largest in the world. There are five regions of Africa. We have Northern Africa, we have West Africa, we have East Africa, we have Middle Africa, we have Southern Africa. In all these Africas, we have each of these regions, we have their different countries. For Northern Africa, we have five countries. For West Africa, we have 16. And for East Africa, we have 18. And the most, most largest population in West Africa. Then we also have Middle Africa. Then we have Southern Africa. Southern Africa is the smallest and large in, in the population. Now in Africa, there is an estimate of at, at, uh, at least 1.3 billion people living in Africa. And these billion people consume of 12% of world population. That's to tell you how big Africa is. In uh, one the other, all the countries in Africa, Nigeria happens to be the most largest country in Africa. We are, this is where I also come from. Now, this is a map of Africa. If you look at the map of Africa, the blue color shows where we have the Northern Africa. We have different color shows where each of the region in Africa belongs to. So we look at, we have the blue is not a West Africa. We have the Central Africa. This is Central Africa. We have the Northern Africa. We have the East Africa. We have Southern Africa. So that's to tell you each of the country where it belongs to the region of Africa. So what is infection disease? Because what we want to talk about is infection diseases in Africa. And we can't talk about infection disease if we don't describe each of these countries where they belong to in Africa. So that is why we'll give you a brief introduction about what is infection disease in um, Africa. Now, what is infection diseases? We know that infection diseases known as communicable disease are diseases caused by pathogens that enter into the human body. It's things that enter into the human body that make them to be sick, made them to be ill, that what are, those are the things that infection diseases are also call them communicable diseases. They can be emerging infection diseases, they can be re-emerging infection diseases. Now, when we talk about emerging infection diseases, there are diseases that is unknown with previous outbreak. We don't know the outbreak, when it happens, and some of them we also know, but they rapidly increase in indents and spreading more wide in last two decades. And some of them can be uncontrollable persistence of disease. And such diseases, for example, like HIV, it can have also dengue, a dengue a fever, it can also have a West Nile virus, it can have Zika virus, it can have SARS. Yeah, these are some of the examples of these diseases. But HIV has been there for more than two decades and it's also continuing to spread more and more. Now, re-emerging diseases are those diseases that reappear after they have been on a significant decline. For example, like diseases that were controlled for a while after they now come up again and become an epidemic that affects many people. So those are the re-emerging diseases that reappear after they have been on significant de um, decline. Example, example of them is malaria. Example, another example, tuberculosis. We also have uh, gorilla, we have cholera. They are part of these examples of re-emerging diseases. But all these diseases can happen both in Africa and outside Africa. Those that is re-emerging diseases in Africa include HIV, Ebola virus disease, Lassa virus, and COVID-19, which is the one that happened recently, two years back. Then we also have re-emerging infection diseases in Africa, which is example, Western virus, MPOS, 
tuberculosis are drug resistant malaria. Then for this, um, for the diseases that we have, there are some things that cause this disease. There are different pathogens that cause this disease. Example of them will have, there are five of them will have viruses, bacteria, fungi, and the parasites and prions. They are the parts of this, these uh, pathogens that cause these diseases. Each of these diseases can belong to any of these pathogens. For the viruses, viruses are very small germs that can affect hosts and make them sick. The host can be humans, can be plants, can be animals, can be bacteria, can, can be fungi. It can be any of this, but the viruses have to, you need a host, it affects the host and make them sick. Example of these viruses, we have influenza viruses. We also have a um, coronavirus, which you can have like COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 that causes COVID-19. We have a human virus virus, which can also cause cancer, such as cervical cancer. Example of, the, of them again, we also have hepatitis virus, which can be hepatitis A, B, C. We also have different types of these viruses that can cause HIV, that can cause uh, HPV. They can also affect bacteria too. So these are the, these families of viruses are the viruses that we have, diseases associated with them. They, they also have bacteria. What are bacteria? Bacteria are living organisms. Bacteria are living things with only one single cell that can reproduce quickly. Bacteria reproduce quickly because wherever it affects, it produces as fast as they have a multiple of it. And common bacterial disease we have we have meningitis, we have wound infections, we have tuberculosis, we have um, typhoid, cholera, we have different types of bacterial diseases. They also have parasites. Parasites are organisms that live in or, or with another organism, where they feed, grow, or multiply in a way that harm their host. Parasites live in an organism and they grow there. Most times they don't kill, they don't kill their host fast. And most, and most times they cause a life-threatening disease, a, a life-threatening illness. And they need their host to survive. They don't survive on their home. They need their host to survive. And it can affect human, it can affect animals, it can affect, it can affect uh, anywhere they go to, they try to feed themselves there and grow more and multiply. And they multiply fast. A major parasite in Africa we have is, many of them are from, the greater tropical diseases. We have malaria, we have bookworm, we have cryptosomiasis, we have guinea worm, we have onchoacriasis, which can also call liver brain disease. We have a uh, lymphatic paralysis, a lot of parasite diseases in Africa. They also have fungal wild, uh, living things that can classify from separated from plants and animals. If you look at the picture we have here, this is an example of it, fungi infection. When it affects, it spreads, and most times it affects the skin, the nose. It can also affect the throat, the lungs. This is at the neck, the fungal infection disease. This is also at the hand, it continues to spread. It also affects the nose. And most times it causes, is heavily drive by poverty, for example, if the skin is not taken care of, it can also cause the fungal infection diseases, which can also con continue to spread. Another thing that um, also drive it is also tuberculosis and HIV. It gives them, it give opportunity for those diseases to uh, affect human being. But mostly poverty is also part of it because if you don't have access to good water, the water you have can also affect your skin. Then the last one we have is which is a type of protein that can trigger normal protein in the brain. This is not as common as other pathogens that we have talked about. Most times it happened by, it happened to women by eating out infected meat products. Infected meat products, most times they affect animals. And when humans eat those animals, they are get infected. Now, these diseases, how damage has it done to Africa? 
Infection disease is one of the leading cause of death in Africa, and it continues to kill millions of people every year. In Africa alone, 4.1 million deaths were recorded by infection disease in 2019 alone. And one of those things that contribute this is poverty and poor health care among the contribution. Poverty, because most times people don't have access to buy, people don't have money to get drugs, to take care of their cell when they are sick. Sometimes people don't have money to get to the hospital. So that also affects them. And sometimes another thing that also causes it is that not having access to a good water to take also can cause the sickness and they, they don't have access to good water. In 2020, in 2001, one person spent on average $36 in healthcare in Africa per year. This is to compare with what is attainable in US, $4,800 per year. So that will show you that the kind of things that will, kind of things that undergo in Africa. 32% of population is under nourished due to poverty. And these are mostly affect children. This is what causes most of the mortality rates for children under five years old. And six out of the world, six out, five out of the six worst countries in the world, for, um, mortality rates under, under five years old are from Africa. What are we trying to say? If there are six worst countries in the world undergoing mortality rate, five of them is from Africa. And this happens due to undernourishment for children. Then 70% of population in Africa survive in less than $2 per day. Per day. At least now it's better, before it was $1. Now it's, it's, it has increased to $2. That's to tell you how the poverty is affecting, they're making the things in Africa to be very difficult for people living in Africa. Now, when we look at this diagram we have here, we have, this is a, a, a chart, cost of death in the world and Africa. What we have here is the world. What we have here is African region. This is taken from WHO website. If we look at what we have here in Africa, we'll see that the majority of deaths in Africa is caused by communicable diseases. Because the, 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 what, the, first, the first color shows injuries, deaths due to injuries. Then the second color, which shows like green, show the a death caused by communicable diseases, both uh, um, children too. Then the last one shows the non-communicable disease. Now, when we look at the two, the food, two charts, we we'll see that most of the things that cause mostly deaths in Africa is coming from the communicable diseases. To tell you how the diseases is affecting African region, African continent. Now, when you come to the war at large, you see that non-communicable diseases is what that is leading the deaths. And most times this affects the, the elderly more. But for this particular one we have here, when we look at the next slide, we see that it's mostly affected by children. Now, when we look at what are the causes of these basic diseases in Africa, we see that we have, apart from the, the first disease, which is a disorder, Another with diseases we can see, apart from the first, sex, the first two is uh, lower respiratory infections, HIV, malaria, diarrhea disease, it continues to go down like that. So showing that the most of the deaths caused in Africa is mostly come from the first five, and more especially the third, fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth, and most of the major killings in Africa. They are acute respiratory infection, HIV, diarrhea, malaria, and tuberculosis. These are the leading cause of death in Africa when infection diseases is consigned. Now, when we look at the age distribution of these deaths, we now look at in Africa, we now see that most of the death is caused between under five. When we look at under five, we see that the, the, the percentage is high compared to other percentage. And why? Because these are children, that is young and they don't have access to, they are, some of them are not malnourished, they don't feed well, and that also causes them sickness too. And sometimes their parents also are poor to take care of them. So that also causes a lot of death. 
And also not having a good medical facility is also one of the things that cause these deaths because when a child is there, is sick, parents don't have access to go to the hospital to become a problem. And most times, before you know what is happening, the, the child um, will, will die. And another thing also causes that sometimes the access to the hospital is also a problem. But most times when disease causes, they cause in um, rural areas where people don't even have access to transport to get to the hospital. And if I thought there is hospital, maybe the hospital may be far from where people are living. Then when we come to this under age five cause of death, we'll see that respiratory infection, diarrhea and malaria is the top three that causes death in Africa in a, under these children under five. And that is why there is a immunization that is a compulsory to give within under five, which also they encourage parents to try to do that so that children, those childhood diseases can also reduce to an extent. Now, apart from all these diseases, all diseases that are mentioned belonging to different categories of viral, whether it's virus disease or bacterial diseases, there is this particular disease within them they call neglected tropical diseases. Why are we bringing it up in this topic? Because it's, it's endemic in Africa. Neglected tropical disease means that, neglected means that it is neglected and it's also caused in a tropical area. There are a group of diseases, there are like 20 conditions of disease that prevalence in tropical areas in Africa. And these diseases have affected more than 1 billion people. And most times it's happening in a very poor community where people don't have access. And most of them are parasites, most of them are bacteria. So why are they calling them neglected? They are calling them neglected. They are mostly affect the poorest population living in rural areas. People living in the urban slum, conflict zones, and almost accept for assent from the global health um, agenda. What I mean by global health agenda? Because they look at it, oh, this is not a disease that is much consigned. So they are not part of the global health um, agenda. So most times they neglect them. But this disease is actually causing a lot in African region. Especially it affects the poor, where the poor, the poor people live in rural areas. And most of these neglected tropical diseases are, are, are vector bomb diseases. That's animal reservoir. And they also has to do with the life cycles. A life cycle from the animal to human, back to human to animal. And also they cause a lot of problems. They can affect the child, childhood growth. They can cause a mental issue. They can cause blindness, like uncle ichthyosis can cause a, a blindness if it's not, care is not taken at, at earlier stage. So they can cause disability, this disease. Um, these are the list of these diseases, 20 of them. There are many of them. These are the list of all the 20 neglected tropical diseases. These diseases are not common, but they are, for example, kistosomiasis is the second lead of disease in Africa, apart from malaria. It's the most disease that mostly affecting Africa and apart from malaria. So we also have a, uh, Uncle is the second cause of blindness after trichoma. Second cause of blindness after trichoma, Uncle is the liver blind disease. So these diseases are, are neglected, but they are eating up many people because one thing with this disease, most of them, when you, are, when you get infected, you won't know. It's after some years, you start seeing the effects of this disease on your body. By then, it must have affected so many things in the body. Now, the infection disease have a lot of impact in Africa. And one of those impacts is that in our health and demographic indicators. What we mean by health and demographic indicators is that it affects mortality rates, it affects life expectancy, it affects age, it affects sex. You go, what we say about age, because, okay, for example, now, under, under five, is affecting under five. And when it's affecting under five, it affects grown up, growth, growth of moving to um, above under five. So that affects them. And one, one of the indicators is that the life expectancy of Africa, that eight African countries have reduced to 47 years life expectancy. That is what these diseases have caused. The most that eight out of 54 countries in Africa have reduced to 47 life years life expectancy. And it costs mostly, it costs more death, especially in mortality, children cause more deaths in children and also more health workers, also loss, loss of more health workers because 
because of uh, when there is when this, the diseases are there, there is tendency that the health workers sometimes, if they are not protected, also due to health care challenges facility, they also get infected, and that also affect the health care workers first in the hospital, and also it's also increasing number of beds in the hospital too. It's also increased the number of beds in the hospital. And also it give opportunity to other diseases too. This uh, like HIV, AIDS and other diseases, it forced more people to have more, take more bed because of those diseases. Now, when you come to economics, it also affects business, investment, industry, and agricultural sustainability. Why? Because if more people are dying, people will not be there to do more business. Agricultural forces, agricultural forces that need youth, there won't be more people to assess that. For example, HIV kills and disabled adults in their best productive age. Both best productive age, just seen it, HIV affects youth, affects, it can affect anybody, but mostly when it affects youth, it, have, it disables them that they can't work and it affects the economy. And it causes about, it causes a lot of damages too in Africa. Then malaria, for example, causes Africa more than $12 billion a year. Showing is, this also is, is slowing his economic growth by 1.3 annually. Malaria, this is what it costs African region, 12 billion a year. Then also, we also have that coming to livestock, because some of these diseases affect livestock. Over 3 million livestock died annually due to sleeping sickness cost. And this also costs about 4.5 billion in agriculture. When the livestock are dying, you see it's also causing a problem in agriculture. So these are the, the indicator in economic uh, impacts of diseases in, our, in African economies. Now for education, just uh, in the situation where a parent is infected with HIV, and a parent that it makes many children to become, become orphans at earlier stage of their life. It makes some of them to drop out of school because they have to take care of their sick parents. You also have the, the, the children's ability to learn. You also have the capacity of teachers because when people are infected, these diseases are affecting many people. Some teachers may be also affected. That also affects them to take care of their works too. It also affects the upbringing of the family too because when one person in the family is sick, it's almost everybody is sick. Nothing can be moved. Everybody is, also, is actually sick. Now for malaria too, for example, malaria affects the education capacity of African countries. As it affects mostly under five, African children, why they're on diarrhea. For example, when diarrhea is affecting uh, children, it makes them to, they won't go to school, they will be at home. And most times if care is not taken also, if care is not taken, no access to the hospital also affects the children. That's most of the things that cause under five deaths, mortality rates. Now, globally, too, this infection disease is also have effect globally, too. For example, malaria accounts for 10% of African diseases body, which is supposed to be 35% lower with that malaria. So just imagine malaria accounts for 10 and 35 lower. So there's a lot of difference between that. Then when you come to African countries, where 34 belongs to the lower income group and 12 are lower middle income countries, only eight countries are classified as higher middle income and no African country have ever reached higher income level. That should tell you how the disease is affecting Africa, even in the global impact too. For human development, no African country belong to higher human development. Most of African countries are in lower human development, while the remaining occupy the middle human development group. In 15 years, for example, from 1990 to 2006, HIV made African countries to lose 10 of place in human development ranking. Between 2090 to 2006, HIV made human for Africa to drop down in their position. So that is the impact of the, the global impact of disease on economic and human development. Now, there are so many diseases in Africa, but we are going to take just some of these diseases for this our course. Discussion we're going to base in pathogens, viral, bacteria, fungi, and parasites and their disease bodies in Africa. And the mode of their transmission, prevention, treatment of the disease, 
And for the viral disease, we are going to look at Ebola virus and Lassa fever virus. For bacteria, we are going to look at crystal, uh, tuberculosis and cholera. The fungal infection, we are going to look at cryptococcus. Then for parasite disease, we are going to look at cryptosomiasis and onchoechiasis and malaria. We are not looking at HIV because we feel that HIV is already a global, a global disease that is affecting not only particularly to Africa. So that is why we're exempting the HIV in this presentation. Now, this is the major diseases affecting Africa. When we look at this table, we see there are a lot of diseases here, but these are the major ones. There are a lot of diseases, but these are the major diseases affecting Africa and the disease body in Africa. Um, the disease where they belong, whether it's a parasite disease, a bacterial disease or viral disease. So when we look at the, what we have here, we see that we have uh, Ebola virus may not be uh, may not affect much, but it's still affecting. It's, it's still affecting the 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 Africa a lot since the time it started. Then we have tuberculosis. This is what we have in tobacco: nine million being infected. We have HIV, which is also a global uh, disease. Then we have tuberculosis. We have typhoid fever which is affecting about 20, 22 million cases in 2021. We have yellow fever. So these are the body of this disease. We have, we have hepatitis, which is different hepatitis B, A, C, and E. So there are so many diseases we can think about. Now, these this, this diseases we have here count about 80% of infection disease in the body and claim about 9 million people per year. And 80% of this burden of disease account for malaria and cystosomiasis. 80% of this disease burden is account to malaria and cystosomiasis. So what we want to talk about tuberculosis. What is tuberculosis? Once we start with tuberculosis, what is tuberculosis? Tuberculosis is a deadly infection disease that has been in the endless war with man since ancient day. And the organism is caused by mycobacterium. It was discovered by Robert Cole in, in 1882. So it has been, it has, it has been more than so many years that tuberculosis have been there, and it has been killing human for thousands of years and still affect one million people every year. So is it that there is no intervention so far? Why is it tuberculosis after 1,000 years is still affecting as many people? As it is, and it's one of the major diseases affecting Africa. So we have the major risk to tuberculosis. It has a lot of risk to human. Tuberculosis, someone that have HIV, there's a major factor for tuberculosis. One of them is HIV. It affects old age people. It affects everybody, but also affects old age people. Somebody that is old, there is tendency to be exposed to tuberculosis. They also affect the lower social economic status like homeless. When there is crowd, people that doesn't have where to stay and they back up in one place to stay, it can also affect them, especially if there's one person that is infected. And that's why most times, even in the prison, in some of the African region, it affects more even people that is in the prison too. When there is overcrowding person, it also affects people there. When there's Poor nutrition is also affect people. It's also when there is a prolonged close contact with the person, person that has the tuberculosis also affect people. So those are the risk factors for tuberculosis. And this tuberculosis can be affected by someone that has it by a rosary drop out, droplets from someone that has tuberculosis in the lungs. So when the person sneezes, there is a means that it can affect people that is in a very close range with that person. Tuberculosis in Africa. Tuberculosis is not pe peculiar to Africa. Tuberculosis, but for Africa, is one of the leading major diseases in Africa. They affect a lot of people, both in any age. And that is why tuberculosis is one of the immunization vaccine they give to children at birth. They give it to children at day one, they give back to them, BCG, so that to protect the children against tuberculosis. So in 2019, 25% of the global body of tuberculosis are from Africa. That is only 14% of world population. In Africa, over 
25% of tobacco deaths have been reported. Now, just imagine in the whole of the world, 25% is coming from Africa. That means that is actually, that is a very big number coming from Africa because we, the world alone, they were not having 25 coming from Africa. Then in 2018, four countries are in South Africa, Southern Africa, six countries are from East Africa, three countries in Central Africa, and three countries in West Africa are among the 30 high tobacco body countries worldwide. What are we trying to say? In 2019, all the countries that have higher index of tobacco losses, those countries, some of them are coming from this region of Africa. Four coming from Southern, I mean, how many countries do we have in Southern Africa that four comes from Southern Africa? That means it's almost covering a, a lot of countries in a, a, a lot of region in that Southern Africa too. Now for tobacco losses, uh, distribution. It can vary by country by country, it depends, depends on the prevalence. For example, in Africa, we have 72%. Prevalence of tobacco, index of tobacco is 72% from Africa, followed by India, 27, China, 9, Indonesia, 8, and Philippines, 6. Just look at the range of tobacco to other to other countries. Africa alone is 72. So telling that there are a lot of index uh, prevalence in, of tuberculosis in Africa. Nine out of the 12 West African countries have tuberculosis in incidence rate greater than 100,000 population. So that's 17 West African countries, nine out of them have very high incidence rates of tuberculosis. And one of the, those are the countries that is within this body of uh, tobacco. One of them is like Nigeria, which is where I come from. Liberia, we have Ghana, we have Guinea Bissau, and also they also add up to 30 high tobacco HIV body countries in the world. Because most times, tobacco and HIV most times go together. They co infect because someone that have HIV have a tendency to, to contact tobacco because give opportunity for the being that the person is sick with HIV, give opportunity for the person to have tobacco if you have a close range with someone that has uh, tobacco because the HIV is already damaging the immune system of that person. So the person is already exposed to any disease around. So what are the interventions so far for tobacco? Is we talk about BCG. BCG vaccination is one they give to children, I bet. They also talk about there is another early case detection using clinical and laboratory tools. If the cases it can be identified early, it can also help in controlling tuberculosis. We also have a treatment with antibiotics, appropriate antibiotics, because most times antibiotics can also fail. They also have to do some, there is um, recently, there is another aspect that was introduced, gene experting as the main rapid diagnostic to for tobacco in sub-Saharan Africa. The reason is that most time when you to carry out the detection, it may take a lot of time. So these are the things that can give a rapid diagnosis of uh, tobacco causes. And this is what is going on recently in sub-Saharan Africa right now. Now, but there's challenges in so, um, controlling the, um, tobacco losses, TB. One of those challenges is because where there is HIV, a lot of HIV in this, there is a tendency of having the a, a tuberculosis in this because there's always this uh, co-infection with HIV. And sometimes stigmatization um, can also cause it, like people, uh, someone that had um, a tuberculosis, people will just like, oh, this person have tuberculosis, everybody will stay away. So that is one of the challenges. And in that case, people can actually cannot help that person to, to get uh, um, get help so everybody will run away and start running away from someone that has it. Also, there is also a, one of the other problem is delay in identifying the case of so someone that have a tobacco. There's always this delay or identifying the case that this person have a tobacco losses. Then sometimes one of the another problem that also come is uh, people not taking their drugs adhering to drug administration. Sometimes some people don't take, and then there's also other strains of tobacco losses that can also come. Maybe you are suffering from this stream of tobacco losses, then there is a tendency that there be an, another imaging, another resistant tobacco, another imaging resistant stream of that tobacco due to, due to antibiotics too. 
Now there is this thing that WHO initiated. They initiated that end to back loss in 2014. 2014, but the, the reason for that, they want to reduce the tobacco is, uh, number of deaths of tobacco and tobacco index by 90% and 80% respectively by 2020, by 2030, and then 95 and 90 by 2035. This is an initiative they are making. And so far, we are waiting that everything will put in order for this tobacco to be reduced. So far, there have been a slow pace of success in also in trying to get this, because this is their target 2030 and 2035. This is what we want to achieve. But so far, there have been a slow pace to this success. There are a lot of things affecting to get this done because so this uh, tuberculosis most times happens with co-infection with other diseases. So it makes it difficult even to control those diseases. You have to look at control both diseases that co-infected human beings. So now, you know, we have talked about the infection, about tuberculosis, what height affects Africa, height affects uh, the height affects different regions of Africa. Now I want to look at the mathematical models of tuberculosis because as, my, as a mathematician, what are the works so far done in tuberculosis and what do we need to do again to make this work? What, what do we need to do to increase to control this tuberculosis. So mathematical model, of course, we know is a, a, an important role in planning of tuberculosis control in Africa. Modern is a useful tool to understand the dynamics of an epidemic that will help to prevent spreading of that infection diseases. Mathematical model have contributed a lot to future epidemics and its control. That will, for example, you know what happened during the COVID, how mathematical model has play a lot of role in the controlling of COVID-19. So I have to show you what mathematical model is doing so far in controlling of infection diseases. Now, from 1962, the first mathematical model of tuberculosis was developed, and that was developed by Wiley in 1962. It developed a, a linear system of difference equation. It's a difference equation developed. These are the type of system we develop. This is exposed and this is infected. So we have our A. Our A is incident rate. Our E is the per capita progression rate from E to I. Then we also have G, which is treatment rate. Treated humans will become members of Latin TB class again. What it means that when they when they are treated, they can also become go back again. They are not treated forever. So what it means that once you are infected with TB, even if you recover from TB, it doesn't mean that you can't be infected again. So that is what that particular parameter is showing. Though of course we have the death, each of this each of this equation has death related diseases. Now, but there is a limitation to this model. This model is was analyzed, but there is some limit a limitation to this model. One of them is that linear model. Having a linear model cannot account the mechanism of tuberculosis transmission. Because when it comes to tuberculosis, someone got infected, someone is not infected, then somebody that is infected come in contact with that person. So it's no longer, a linear model cannot take account of that. So that is one of the limitations of this model. Now being the first model in tuberculosis too, is a, is a, a difference equation, which of course can be transformed to a differential equation, not nine differential equation. So these are the, some of the limitations to this particular model. Now, the model was later improved by Broga. Later improved this model. What, do, what did he do? He had to include H. He had to combine linear and nonlinear infection rates. It's no, it's no longer a linear infection. He had to combine both linear and nonlinear infection rates. So what did he do here? It's also a difference equation. So it's also a difference uh, equation model. This Z we have here is an adjust, adjusting parameter to differentiate between normal infection, super infection, and direct lapse within a very short period. So what it means is that when this Z is equal to one, you have a nonlinear term, which will give you this term we have here. When it's equal to zero, we have a linear term, which will give infection directing to number of a susceptible class. 
Then the prevalence of the, the disease, which is equal is for you to adjust, for adjusting the all inflow rate. And of course, because it's a disease that when, you, when somebody cough in the air, if it's crowded, it can affect many, as many people that is around. So it's a disease that has to depend on the population. So, now, what was the aim? The aim of their model was to compare different control strategies, finding and treating more cases, utilization of vaccination, and mass recogenograph. So, but there is a limitation to their model. The limitation is that it's a difference model. The model they developed from the one model it was a different model. Then, after then, the, then the nonlinear. The nonlinear ordinary differential equation was developed by Rivard. So what he did was to introduce the infection rate that depends linearly on prevalence using a probabilistic approach, homo homogeneous missing. So the total population, so what he was trying to do is to develop, a, is to apply it to a developing country. So the developing country was a trying to aim is to apply it to a developing country. But one of the things you ignore in that model was you do not consider the population structure, you ignore the population structure. That's how is the population being? Because when you look at tuberculosis, it can affect based in different age. So you, you do not look at how the population structure is, is taken care of. So those are the things, one of the limitations of this work. Then after them, many models have been developed to neutralize how the control strategies were applied to tuberculosis, the minimum cost. And one of those models we have is there, we have Chavez and Son. I've done a lot of work in tuberculosis, in which one of this uh, work he did, where one of them is where he developed a um, central manifold method that, that normally they are widely used for um, bifurcation, forward and backward bifurcation, to know the direction of bifurcation. So it's one of the tuberculosis work that he established that particular approach. Then another work that I also have done, what he did was to look at the slow and fast routes of SEI model. SEI model, S is a susceptible class, exposed and infected. The infected rate here is divided in e, a boat, divided in E class, slow, slow routes and I class, the fast routes. Slow routes is that they are still within their latent period. So in variable latent period, so you, are, you also look at arbitrary distribution of the latent period, not exponential latent period, arbitrary distribution. So you do not consider exponential latent period. So also look at the multiple strain model where you can look at drug sensitivity and drug resistant types. Then also look at the multiple strain and variable latent period. Because it's a different, in that part, this particular article, we have like about three, four different models of tuberculosis in different stage. The first one is the first one where you look at the slow and fast routes. Then later you modify it to look at the very, very variable latent period. Then later you look at, okay, if, if there is drug resistant, drug sensitive, sensitivity and drug resistant type. You also look at where you have multiple strain of tuberculosis and consider the age of uh, infection. So those are the work he did in this uh, article. Then, then we will now look at, so many of the tuberculosis model come from the basic model we know, SII model. This is SIM model, which is also done by the art school in, in, in reference to itself. What you consider here, you consider a changing environment, a changing population, where the recruitment and birth rate in the population it depends on the population. Now you look at, uh, but one of the things he did not consider here, for example, he did not take note of death caused by death caused by tuberculosis. Also, he did not consider, although he considered recovery, but he did not differentiate different age. He did not consider vaccination. He did not consider, of course, the vaccination way more because if children are given vaccination at, z at zero age, that means as time goes, why are people getting infected? Because the vaccination way more at times goes on. So within this model develop. It has a transmission rate, we have recovery rate, we have death, we have birth rate. Now we have the basic reproduction number. Of course, which is, uh, if it's less than one, the tuberculosis will eradicate in the community. If it's greater than one, it remains in the population. So what he's trying to do is if more than one person are infected, on average, one person, more than one person are infected, one on one person 
when you introduce one person in the population and more than one person are infected, mean that tuberculosis will continue to remain in the population and continue to grow more and more. But what is the limitation of this model? The model do not take in, into account age, vaccination, or when immunity. Because age of people that is infected, because when we look at tobacco, we say it affects older age people. Also, it affects people that also has HIV more. So there are so many, there are so many things to consider in the modeling of tuberculosis. Then after this model, then the model was also progressed to SCI model because tuberculosis does not manifest immediately. There is incubation period before the tuberculosis will manifest. So this model also considered the latent period of that, of tuberculosis disease by including E class. Also in this model, the death due to disease was also not considered. So the limit, also we do not consider the age too, the vaccination too, and the women immunity was also not considered. Then also have a, another, the model was also extended to BESI model. The B here is like the children vaccinated, even though you consider BCGA um, vaccinated people. Because take it that at, at, uh, when a child is giving birth, they give a BCG, BCG vaccine to the child against tuberculosis. So there is a class of people vaccinated. So it consider, if for example, some people are not vaccinated. So we have it, these are the class of people vaccinated. When they are vaccinated, they will join this class. When they are also not vaccinated, they will join this class. So in this model now, when they are vaccinated, are they completely protected? Nobody can assure that. I also look at this. Within this zero age, they are vaccinated. At what age is their disease, at the vaccination way more? That was also not taken account of because that will also help you to know oh when is the when is it going to be likely for someone to get protected when is the protection against vaccine you, you took as a child is going to wear more so you can know how to get it. so those are the things these things we are not considering this particular model of course the the vaccination actually if uh, uh, the vaccination of BCH was considered too but the age and women immunity was also not considered that is also very important in order to Think about the control to implement in controlling tobacco disease. Now, after then, there have been so much mathematical model for tobacco We have a lot of them that develop. Of course, this develop uh, later. Uh, Chava has also developed. We have done a lot of work in tobacco, both both partial, ordinary differential equation, different age scores. So we have done a lot of work on tobacco losses. Later, they focus on four models that discuss the tobacco dynamics too. Then later, there is another SER. These are different SEI model or SI model that have developed tuberculosis model to see how it can be helped in controlling tobacco. They are just simple model that try to look at how can this be helped to control tuberculosis disease. Some of them are applied to Ghana, which is from Africa. Some of them also apply to China, which also have index of tuberculosis too. Now I want to look at from those models so far, there have been a lot of models developed so far. A lot of them have, have gone through. A lot of models have developed. So the, one of these models I want to look at is this particular model, the model that consider vaccination and diagnosis. Now, it consider vaccination and diagnosis here because if people are vaccinated and diagnosis, they want to see how it can help to reduce the infection and tuberculosis. And one of them is that one of the things that is new here is that we have latently infected humans, people that are within the, uh, the latent stage of the disease. We have the, the infected for compartment here is divided into two, uh, which is undiagonized infected woman and diagonized infected woman. We also have treatments, people going through treatment. This is our T here is treatment. Then we have recovery. So the question we have here is that, so people come into this population, People come into this population, X, of course, they can use it by natural death rates, anything that can cause death except the disease. Then they, some of them move to the latent period, some of them move to undiagnosed infected people. Then also from the undiagnosed infected people, they are they are isolated, they are they are diagnosed and detect their cases and they become diagnosed infected people. Then some of these people can also become undergo treatment because if you are not if you are not diagnosed 
the tuberculosis may also put the person down. The person may become a become sick that you have to come to the hospital. The person can undergo treatment in the hospital, even though the person was not identified. The essence of diagnosis is that the person is identified early. It's like early detection of tuberculosis. But when the person is not detected early, the person, the tuberculosis can continue to um, damage the person's immune system to bring the person down and the person will get to the hospital to be, to take treatment. Then we have vaccinated people. So the vaccination we have here is that people can be vaccinated from sustainable class. After vaccination, the vaccination went up, they will still go back to sustainable class too. So these are what this V implies. Some of them can also go to exposed class when they come in contact with infected people after a while. And some of them can also go to undiagnosed infected people. So this is what this model is all about. And it's also the model was on analyzed and the discussion, the, the results also show that the vaccination and diagnosis have to reduce the tuberculosis disease. But the question is that this particular implementation has also have been going on. Why is tuberculosis still persisting in Africa? They also have some models that also have worked on vaccination for tuberculosis. Some, the, some people have also, like the author Lee have also considered combination of constant vaccination and post vaccination. Then you have to consider the combination of considering two types of vaccination. They also have a um, work done by Ebet Tade and Ibrahim. They consider treatment, immigration and vaccination. Immigration, because you look at, oh, people can have tuberculosis and travel to another place and spread the tuberculosis in that place. So that's that one is also considered treatment of tuberculosis. Then also they consider also, there's another one that also consider vaccination where people are, but, uh, so where people are vaccinated. This vaccination can be a vaccination before it comes before S compartment. It may be a vaccination at the zero age, people that are vaccinated are with a BCG. So I also have someone that consider the vaccination of newborn and older susceptible individuals in their model. What it means that Apart from the newborn, which is uh, children at birth, they also consider vaccinating the older age because the people that is old are also at risk of tuberculosis. So consider the vaccinating the old people, it can also help to reduce the index case of tuberculosis. So apart from this control vaccination, the other controls that people have considered, people have also considered the case detection of tuberculosis as a control. People also have considered Drug, res drug resistance to backlogs is the ultimate control model. People also have considered case finding, distancing, because since they are when someone call, if you are close by, people can get infected. So someone, they cause, another has also considered, okay, when there is distancing, can you reduce the spread of tuberculosis? They also have considered treatment. There have been treatments of tuberculosis. There have been a lot of treatments of tuberculosis and the effects. So, Treatment alone, from what the story, from the so far from the research, treatment alone is not enough to control tuberculosis. One of the things is early detection. This early detection can be case finding, case finding early detection of someone that has tuberculosis. Then another thing you also look at. Some people also have considered time dependent control, like some other control that is non non pharmaceutical controls, like case finding, like latent case finding. What that came past in case find is like somebody that is within the Latin period. How can you find that one? Is it actually possible to find someone that is within the Latin period of tuberculosis? That is a very big question. To, how can we find that in the in the reality? Someone that has a tuberculosis at earlier stage of Latin period of it. So there is still possible research to do in tuberculosis. There are a lot of research to do in tuberculosis because it's a bacterial disease. Also, okay, if these diseases are caused by when there is crowding, bacteria, you know how can bacteria can spread, and you know how can bacteria can stay in an environment. They are actually, although they are studies have considered environment, but it's only one study considered environment in China. The effects of a contaminating environment of tobacco is need to be studied in Africa, even though that has been considered in China. But I feel that environments have a lot to do with tobacco losses, apart from the spread. The environment also have a lot to do with tobacco because bacteria can stay as long as it's not like virus that 
after a while it, it, it dies up in the environment. Bacteria can stay as much in the environment. Then they also have to do, okay, this vaccination is given at, it, at, it, at birth. Is there a booster dose of vaccination that can be given? For example, study like study can further study can look at okay if people after five years of a child or maybe after 12 years of a child people should be given like if people consider like booster vaccination see how it can help to reduce the tobacco in this case in africa then another thing too is that one of the challenges we have in africa most times is that getting data to suit to our model because if we have access to data, that will give you a clear picture of what is going on and how to fit it and fit it in your model to give a real representation of how this disease can be controlled. Which region needs to be put more work and which region needs to be relaxed a bit in order to know how you portion the control of tuberculosis in Africa. And also good to consider drug treatment labs because antibiotics can fail. Especially sometimes when you take a lot of antibiotic, it becomes so used to the body, it may not even work again. And sometimes the antibiotic, after a while, it can fail, you become infected again. So we also have to model that have to look at the treatment labs due to antibiotic resistance. There are a lot of work that can be done too. Tobacco can also have a co-infection with other diseases apart from HIV. It can also have a co-infection disease with uh, someone that have hepatitis too. They are being exposed to that uh, tobacco system. So that is, there are a lot of things to cover in tobacco system. Now, I want to look at another disease in Africa too. One of those diseases is malaria. Malaria is a lot in Africa. Uh, is a lot. Malaria is, is like, some people will say malaria is African disease. Is it actually African disease? Malaria is affecting many places, but it's more in Africa. It's number one number one cause of death in Africa, apart from the diarrhea. So malaria is a vector bomb parasite disease. So it's, it's caused by a species of a mosquito called plasmodium species. It's being transmitted by female mosquito to a human being. So when the mosquito bites a human being, is in the case of taking a blood meal, if the mosquito is infected, it infects the human being, if the human being is infected and mosquito is not infected, the mosquito gets infected. So it's like, like kind of having a life cycle. So malaria is one of the, is once, there was a time malaria affects half of the world population before it was become eliminated in so many parts of the, part of the world. There was a time it affects half of the world population. But that is not the case today because many, is mostly now affecting Africa. So when it comes to malaria, the, there are symptoms of malaria. Most times, symptoms of malaria, for, for instance, in Africa, we are sometimes we are used to malaria sickness because sometimes, most times, you are tired, you feel headache. The headache, you feel, we are like, oh, I'm tired. You will not even recognize whether you are infected or not. And most times, it's easy for you to have access to drugs. So most times, one of the things that cause the mortality of malaria is that not having quick intervention sometimes relying on self-medication, some of the same. And sometimes malaria also affects where there is a poor living condition. What we mean by poor living condition? Where people don't have access to, where there is, a, there is access, to, where there is a dirty water around where people are living. There's a tendency malaria, that mosquitoes will be there, and which also expose people that live around that place. Now malaria is one of the mortality because the one of the leading cause of mortality rate in children, even on children, newborn babies and everything, malaria, if my, before, before now, a pregnant woman can get infected with malaria and if it's not treated, it can affect the child. It can cause inbirth to the child. It can cause a lot of problems to the child. But I know now because there is a lot of intervention coming. So that's why during the pregnancy, they give like three dose, three, three stages of drugs to a pregnant woman in Africa in order to kill the tendency of a, a pregnant woman being infected with malaria. So globally, from 20, 2000 to 2015, death rate for malaria fell from 40%. That is from 896,000 in 2000 and 562 in 2015. This is globally. It's not in Africa, it's, just, it's not just in Africa. 
Now, there is also have been a segregation since then. But in 2019, COVID, during the COVID uh, pandemic, it affected the efforts making so far in eradicating malaria because during that, everybody was focused on COVID-19. Everybody was focused on COVID-19 in Africa because the, uh, because of the 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 OJC of the spread of COVID-19 that it was affecting the world. But malaria was seriously killing a lot of people because it's one of the diseases that kills the poor. But COVID was more of the disease that killed the rich when it comes to Africa. So the malaria was actually affecting the, the poor people, killing many people. Just look at 2019 alone, it killed about 500. 558,000 persons. That's what malaria killed during that period. And there have been a lot of issues in Africa. Now, under age five, 55% of their death is account to malaria in 2019. Just under a children that's below five years, 55% of them deaths account to malaria disease, account to malaria disease in 2019 alone. So, as to show you how it caused mortality rates in children. Now, this is the word. And when we look at this, we'll see the red color is malaria endemic region, uh, the endemic uh, countries, uh, continents. Then not the why the, the other fake color, which look like gray, is not malaria endemic area. So when we look at this is African, this is African continent. This is the shape of African continent. When we see in African continent, you see that it's only four maybe four countries that is not affected by malaria. Almost all the countries is affected by malaria. They are covered by malaria diseases. That's to show you the, how the impact of malaria is in Africa. It's affecting every region of Africa. So that's why some people, sometimes people will call it this African disease, but that's why not African disease. When we look at it, it's also affecting this part of, like China is affected by malaria too. India is also affected, but for Africa, it's only exempt only four countries, Morocco, Algeria, and Liberia and Egypt. If not, every other country and every other country is affected by malaria. Malaria in Africa. Now in Africa, 228 2, billion malaria infections are recorded, and which recorded about 405,000 deaths worldwide, but more than 90% of them in sub-Saharan Africa. Worldwide, 2,000, we have a 2, 228 million infection, but 90% of it is from Sub-Saharan Africa. So that means a lot of number is from Sub-Saharan Africa. To tell you how it's affecting Africa a lot. Now, apart from this, uh, 29 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa account for 90, 95% of overall two, uh, 229 million infection in the world in 2019. In Sub-Saharan Africa, 95 accounts for 229 million infection rates, inf malaria infection in, in the world in 2019 alone. So when we come to Nigeria, when we come to Africa, Nigeria has about 27% of it. We have uh, DRC, Democratic uh, Republic of Congo, have 12, Uganda. Then we have, um, we have uh, Niger is uh, the least, Nigeria is the least, which is 3%. So when you look at Nigeria, it's still as a very high risk of malaria, which we are come from. We still have a has higher number of percentage of malaria in Africa. Of course, it's the one of the is the largest country in Africa. Nigeria is one of the, is the largest country in Africa. Now between 2010 and 2015, there was a 21% reduction of malaria cases in Africa. And also that leads to 31% reduction in a number of deaths in Africa. So that's saying that if malaria cases reduce, it's also reduce the number of deaths that will occur in African continent. So for us to reduce the number of deaths that occur within African continent, we have to actually work on reducing the index cases of malaria in Africa. There is this thing that goes with malaria and sickle cell. Malaria and sickle cell, where there is index case of sickle cell, there is tendency to have a high index case of malaria. Because when you have high prevalence of sickle cell disease, it's co it collides with region of high index of malaria and density. Because there is a genetic disorder caused by sickle cell shape, red blood cell. 
So what he's trying to say, if you have a sickle cell fever, there is a tendency that you have to have a high cases of malaria endemicity in that region because of sickle, sickle shape red blood cell. So what it means that if there is a sickle cell disease, there is tendency that there will be high case of malaria in that region due to the cost, what the sickle cell cost to the body. What are the interventions so far that have been developed in controlling this malaria? There have been a lot of work going on in controlling uh, malaria in Africa. There is even uh, this brig uh, brigade uh, intervention, malaria intervention that have been going on in Nigeria, in Africa for long now. But so far, it still continues and malaria still continues to grow. So the question is that, is those intervention not working? Because most times, this intervention, like I, I've come to realize that if I actually want to look at this malaria intervention, we have to go, in, we have to look at the community, we have to go into the community, we have to go into those rural areas, we have to have, let people in the rural area have access to water, let people have access to roads, where the water can, there won't be water slum, let people have access to things that will eliminate mosquitoes, because most times mosquitoes stay in a very dirty environment. So if you don't have a dirty environment, there is no tendency mosquito to stay. And mosquitoes stay within the day. In the night, they start looking for where to enter the house. So if there is a mosquito net, it will help you. So far, there have been a public health measures. And one of those public health measures is a widespread or use of insecticide. As a child, I know even as a child that I know my mother used to use insecticide. When we are about to sleep, she will come and spray the insecticide so that it will cover, it will kill mosquito before we sleep. But most times those insecticides have its own back, they have its own drawback. One of the drawback is that it's a chemical. It can, especially someone that have a inhaling problem, that has smell problem, it can affect, affect the breathing of someone. So those chemicals, they are chemicals and it can be sprayed, sprayed when somebody is in that house. You have to spray it and leave it for a while for you to come inside to sleep. And, and so that the mosquito will not. But then after then, the next day you continue to spread it because if the door is open, the mosquito will enter. You continue to spread it. Then another thing, intervention that has been so far is drainage. Because when you have a drainage, when you have a drainage where water from agriculture purpose, they also help to reduce the malaria. Because I say that when there is a, a dump of water, stagnant water, stagnant water, there is a mosquito, there is tendency of mosquito to be there. The social economic development, like effective job accessibility, and improving housing. Now, for example, now there are so many drugs for malaria, but sometimes some of these drugs also have its own resistance, and some of them too having access to them because most of these drugs we buy them. Then those people in the rural areas, some of them cannot afford to buy these drugs. So most of the intervention you see most times go within the urban area. Um, but the intervention so far, we are looking at what are the things to go back to the rural area, those, the poor, because malaria is more of a poor man disease. Because when you have a good environment, when you have a good house, when you have a good drainage, mosquito will not have a place to stay around you. Then insecticide treated nets, bed nets, because there is a, of course, I know one of those times I was pregnant, they, they used to give us mosquito nets. Pregnant women, they would give them mosquito nets. The essence of mosquito net that you should sleep under the mosquito mosquito net so that mosquito will not have access to have a take a blood meal from your body. So what happened? Those mosquito nets, there is some chemical on it that when some of them, when mosquito come to them, they die. Once they perch on them, they die. Some of them, they won't have access to the person sleeping inside. Then they also indoor with a dupe spray that like it can spread indoor. It can spray some chemicals to kill some flies within. The, the house in order to prevent mosquitoes to be in the house. Then the mosquito eradication focus on so many things. What are those things that mosquito eradication focus? One of them is drug and insecticide resistance. Now one of them is funding. Most important thing is funding. Funding for malaria control. If it's possible for people to have access to malaria drug, like some of these drugs that people have access to that, they give to children. If it's possible for people to have access to, there was a time there was access to drug in 
Nigeria, which I know for some time, but after it, there was no access to those drugs. When you have access to the drug, if you are sick, you can easily get drugs. You don't need to look for money to get drugs. You can have a, so there's a, there a call for funding for malaria countries in Africa. If people can have access to drug without thinking of, oh, how can I survive? How can I go and buy? Because someone is sick and someone, I remember malaria sickness is it is after a while it take you down. Initially, you may be feeling, oh, this is a body pain. I just walk, I'm feeling body, I'm feeling a deck. When I sleep, I'll be okay. But before I know what is happening, it starts affecting you. Then another thing is vaccine. So now, another thing is vaccine. Although now there is a vaccine that is undergoing trial now. It's an undergo third stage clinical trial in Africa. So there is vaccine. If there is vaccine for malaria, that will help a lot. If people are vaccine against malaria, it will help a lot in controlling malaria disease in Africa. Then another thing is social economic prosperity because you know malaria can cause a lot of things in the economy. So the, the eradication should be on also in social economic prosperity. Prosperity. Then we also look at the quant the quality of antigen based rapid diagnosed malaria test piece. What I mean that what we use to test malaria, someone that is infected with malaria, we we need something that you can easily identify the person that has malaria immediately, and so that it can call for drug for the person to be treated. If not, that will help to the avert the death that may have caused by the malaria too. Then one of the things also, the education should focus in malnutrition. When people are not feeding well, when people are not feeding well, they are not eating, they are not eating well, there's tendency those people can also be affected because it's just like if someone is feeding well, you are sick, you can easily go and buy drug and take care of yourself. But if you are not feeding well, you focus on eating first before you start treating yourself. So, so intervention so far, these are the where the malaria eradication focus on. So, in, so another thing you look at the intervention that is prioritized. One, we are looking at new malaria vaccine, which is undergoing third clinical trials in most countries in sub-Saharan Africa. It has shown a modesty of 35. 39% efficacy of the vaccine. 39 is very small, but this is a good start. Let's start with that, but 39 is actually very small efficacy. It's not even up to 50%. It has also shown a problem with the predicted diet in full, that if children are minimized, it will have got 484 deaths per 100,000 100, population. So if the vaccine is available to be given to children, because children are mostly affected. It will avert, avert some deaths, number of deaths caused by the malaria by children. So for the malaria we have done with the malaria, we will not want to look at what are the mathematical models of this malaria. There are early mathematical models of malaria. There have been early mathematical models. A lot of work has been done on malaria disease, a lot, and a lot of work are still going on on malaria disease. So we'll start with the, uh, Sarona Rose, of course, that is the one of the name that are very, very pronounced in mathematical modeling because a lot of things were developed by this particular um good re this particular researcher. In 19, he developed a life cycle of malaria parasite in, in mosquito in 1890s. That is that is five years ago. He developed uh, a model to look at the life cycle of the malaria parasite in mosquito. You want to first identify what are the, the life cycle of it in mosquito. Then later you now develop SII, SIS model, SI model, which we know as Rose model in 1911, which is a more of a ordinary differential equation. So what the model is, you want to show that reduction of mosquito number below a certain value figure that a transmission threshold is enough to control cancer malaria um, spread. It's a concept so far ahead of its own time. That is a concept that he made that is going to be sufficient to control malaria. But after then, another model, the other people have also done a model, which is also George. George also did some work where he modified Rose model by including a latent a Latin um, class in the mosquito due to the malaria parasite develop, development has that implicates adult female mosquito. 
survivorship. So what you do that, you look at the latent, latent class of the mosquito, not the human being, latent um, um, class of the mosquito, and see because the parasite development has some, has to have different stages. It, the mosquito don't just get infected and be, don't get something and become infected. It has a stage of latency before it become infected. Then from that result, it provides a rationale that was massively used by WHO in campaign on use of uh, insecticide. So that from his result, it provides something that was used by WHO to make a campaign about insecticide that get that kill mosquitoes. So after he, the work, the work was also later extended. Another work was also extended by by was also extended by this by including a effects of AIDS culture or prevalence. It also include the visitation of people. Like, for example, now, I come from Nigeria. If I'm in Nigeria, I move to Canada. Is someone that gets infected, does it have an impact in another new country? Does it have an impact? So you look at how people migrate from one place to another. What is the effect of it? How does it affect the spread of uh, malaria too? You also, that is also has to do with visitation of people. They also consider human immu immunity. Work have also been done in considering human immunity, parasite diversity, and also resistance to drugs. Then later, the introduction, the later, Andrews and Mary also introduced another model where they introduced, apart from the latency in mosquitoes, they introduced the latency in human. Because if the mosquito have a latency state, they also look at okay, because I can't just get infected. I can't, mosquito cannot just bite me, I become infected. There may be a, a, a small period for me to become infected. I may be infection, may I may not be, I may be infected, but not infectious to infect when mosquitoes take a blood me on my on myself. So they consider that work and look at how it will affect. So one of the major advantages of this early work is that it provides a suitable control strategy through the transmission threshold criteria because. It provide that a threshold that okay if so so this is if within this threshold this malaria can be controlled and for example it's from one of, it's from this one of these early early models that WHO used their results to okay to talk about the, the spread of insecticide in killing mosquito and one of this uh, threshold quantity we are talking about is what we know as basic reproduction number which also based on the productive capacity of the parasite it based on the reproductive capacity of the parasite. So after then, so many models have been modified. So what we have in this flow, di this uh, diagram is that different stages of these three particular model. These are three early model of this mosquito model. We have Rose, we have McDonald, we have uh, Andrews and Mill. These are the work they have done. From this, their work, the work have been spread for different version. This is, uh, from this model, this is SIS model. This is SI model, that is, what this SIS model is that susceptible infected, after you get infected, you become susceptible again because once you have malaria, once you recover, you can have malaria as many times as possible. There's no permanent recovery from malaria. There's no permanent immunity. Now, okay, you have malaria, you cannot get infected. So from this model, we see that there have been a lot of extension of this work. For example, in this one, this is this work was done. They include age in this work where they have to categorize different ages because we said that um, children die more. So they try to categorize different age. Now also, you look at this model, the, the IH here means that, of course, H represents human, M represents mosquito. So each of these letters you have here represent, S represent susceptible class, E represent the exposed class, I represent the infected class, the R represent the recovery, and the name continues like that. So if it's H, it means that it's of human. If it's M, it's of, it means that it's of mosquito. So, so far, you can see there are a lot of work that has been done. Varying population size also have been considered. Constant immigration have also been considered. Immunity in function have also have been considered. Social economic factors have also been considered. Environment have also considered in mosquito environment. So the model has been extended in so many places, so many ways. And will continue to be extended because the mosquito model is still ongoing, because the mosquito is still endemic in Africa. So there have been a lot of complex models for mosquito disease. Of course, age, 
we have you can there is age and age gender also in women. There also immunity class of a uh, mosquito mother. Mother have some mother like the authors here have considered age and gender in women. Also have considered immunity class in also in human. There's also models that have considered post patronage variability and resistant strain models. So where they also consider immunity selection, where they consider inclusion and evolution of drug resistance. This has to do with drug resistance. This also has to do with drug resistance to environmental, pharmacology, pharmacological, and genetic factors. So they also have considered so many, has to do with resistance strain models. They also have considered environment, environmental factor, because one, there's most times um, during uh, enough, most time as growing up, I know that during the rainy season, there used to be a lot of mosquito during the rainy season, because during the rainy season, there are a lot of water, mosquito can fetch on it there, and also mosquito try to get inside the houses also. So they also have considered temperature, temperature too, and they also have considered uh, rainfall, humidity, also have considered wind patterns too, and mathematical modeling of malaria diseases. They also have been in, in research on environmental perspiration, where they have to consider like, so, uh, consider environment, how the frustration uh, of environment, how it affects malaria disease. Also, I consider social and economic factors, which also in the previous slide, how the early stage of model was, were extended in so many ways. They also, also have considered malaria like poverty, how poverty uh, are, are, in, uh, are also related to modern of infection and malaria diseases too. They also have been immigration and visitation too. There's also a link between in-host model, in-host and between host dynamics of malaria disease, uh, disease too. They have been also in-host model of malaria disease too. They also have been uh, stochastic models of malaria diseases, which has to do with human variability in human-based model. They also have been probability variation in different variables and parameters of the transmission. So there have been a lot of model going on on malaria diseases and a lot is still going on now but there is also a sculptures model those models are all um ordinary differential equation now they are all uh, ordinary differential equation but this i want to give an example of a sculptured model this is a sculpture model what it means that is a sculpture model we are talking about is that it has to do with the malaria the mosquito population because you know, mosquito, the susceptible mosquito is adult mosquito. It's supposed to infect it. But there used to be eggs. First of all, there has to be eggs. They have to be larva before the mosquito will mature to adult mosquito before they expose and infect it. So now, if for example, now the mosquito, if for example, mosquito, the eggs are destroyed. If eggs of mosquitoes are destroyed, which is not possible to destroy all of them. If egg or mosquito were but I feel that one of those countries that mosquito have been eradicated, a lot of things were put in, in place for mosquito to, for mosquito to, for malaria to be eradicated in those populations. So this is egg, and this is larva, and this is adult mosquito. This is exposed, and this is a infected mosquito. So also we look at we still maintain susceptible human exposed, infected, and recover. Of course, the recovery will go back. So in this case here, yeah, the human come in contact with infected mosquito. When the infected mosquito um, bites a human, infected mosquito bites a human in the process of blood meal, it infects, it deposits the, par deposit the parasite inside the human body, which causes the human malaria. Then they also, we have that for the, for the mosquito here, also have the mosquito, mosquito can get infected by, a mosquito that is not infected, when it bites an infected human, can also become infected. So what happened here is that everything here, there is no vertical transmission of malaria here. So there is no, because we do not consider that a, a mother can infect a child. We also do not consider that for a case of a mosquito. Too. So this is the model that consider different structures of mosquito, not human, because it consider the egg and the larva before the adults expose an infected mosquito. And which also presents, the results presented that the, the stages of the larva and egg 
if that stages can be taken care of actually there is no need um, the lava to go to, they must go to go to adults or because lava cannot infect a woman is adult mosquito that are flies to infect a woman so if these stages of this mosquito are taken care of and, and that is the aim of this particular work here yeah? this particular author that this work we try to look at what is the effect of these two stages of this mosquito development in the spread of uh, mosquito malaria disease the another is culture that considered uh, seasonality is also this where they consider um this is the uh, egg two this is the lava and this is this is egg and this is lava and this is infected woman and different stages of it. So what happened here is that there is a limitation to this, the effect of climate change on the life cycle of mosquitoes. And the lava and the fast are not the species. So the, in this case here is that we have, this is the, the, the lava because there is a lava and there is a pupas class. Apart from the egg, after the egg, we have a lava, we have a pupa class. So in this case, if we, if we, this model consider that the both lava stage we have put both pupa class and the lava are put together, so that is one of the limitation of this course. I love this particular work here, and the work give a very good result, but there is still so some things that we have to consider because the 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 climate change have effects because the lava for the egg to and the lava stage. The environment helps it to mature to adults. If the environment is not helping, the climate, the environment helps it to mature. So if the, the climate change has an effect to affect the stages of these early stages of mosquito. So, so far, there have been a lot of work in malaria disease, but malaria is still a case in Africa. Immature mosquito have impact on malaria, uh, malaria dynamics. So, so it's very is a one of the things to look at is a very crucial to look at for that. How to look at the life cycle of Ampholias, the mosquito and the climate change effect. And also vaccination and how many population are vaccinated is also a good thing to consider in further research. A lot of work has been done on malaria and the work is still going on with that. So this is a, our references for this presentation so far. So thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Chinwenu. Uh, now I can open it up.